chapter 11, starting with verse number 1. And it came to pass, when Jabin king of Hazor had heard these things, that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and to the king of Shimron, and to the king of Aksaph, and to the kings which were on the north of the mountains, and of the plain south of Chinneroth, and in the valley, and in the borders of Dor on the west, and to the Canaanite on the east and on the west, and to the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Jebusite in the mountains, and to the Hivite under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. And they went out, they and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude, with horses and chariots, very many. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. So as we saw there last time, as we finished up chapter 10, uh, Joshua and the Israelites have finished up the conquest of the southern part of the promised land. So now they control the central part and the southern part. And so now these are the fellows up in the north. And it says there in verse number one that Jabin, the king of Hazor, heard, heard about this. And so he starts sending the word out. And he's sending it out to everybody he knows. In the mountains and valleys, and everywhere all around. He's getting everybody he can uh, to come and join up together. So the southern uh, people had done this same thing. They had an alliance of five kings that had come together, and they weren't able to withstand God's people. Uh, they were utterly destroyed. And yet here we have these folks in the north who are going to attempt to do the same thing. So the conquest of the uh, northern promised land begins and ends in chapter 11. So if you go down to verse number 4, uh, he's sent the word out, and it says, And they went out, they and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude, with horses and chariots, very many. So a lot of these folks answer the call. And we're going to see now, uh, with this particular part of the conquest of the promised land, that Israel's going to face some new challenges. Uh, two in particular that are pointed out for us here in verse number four. First of all, the, the first new challenge is the size of the army. Uh, look at what uh, the Bible says. It says, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude. Uh, there's a lot of sand on the seashore. Uh, but... Uh, this is a great multitude that has assembled and come together for this purpose to fight against God's people. Second challenge is in the last part of verse number four, with horses and chariots, very many. So now they're going to go up against more advanced technology. Uh, this is the first time that we've seen in the conquest of the promised land that they've had to fight against people that had horses and chariots. So the challenges are increasing. And many times we see that in our lives as well. Uh, God has laid out this entire thing, this entire campaign for his people. It started at Jericho uh, with uh, the conquest of that great city. Then they moved to Ai. And then they took on the five kings at once. And now they come up against an even greater number, a multitude as if the sand of the sea. You know, sometimes it seems God does that for us. Uh, he's letting us grow. He was letting his people grow. They were gaining experience with each of these battles, Jericho, Ai, and all the rest, so that they would be prepared for what was coming down the road. I'm glad God's in control of my life Amen. and that he is uh, assembling my battles for me. I trust that, and I believe that tonight. And that he's given me time to grow and gain the experience I need uh, for these greater challenges that may be coming our way. He knows that when we're babes in Christ, we're only able to do so much. But he expects you and I to grow up. And he spe expects us to mature and to become able to do more and more for him and in his service. We see that in his people here. Then in verse number five, it says, And when all these things, 
or all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. So they all are encamped together in this same place, and it is for the purpose of fighting against Israel. Uh, as I read this verse today, it reminded me of something else in the Bible. Does anything come to mind that this kind of reminds you of? Well, I'll tell you what it reminds me of. Let's turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. This is what came to my mind. Of course, it seems like my mind keeps going to the book of Revelation quite a bit here lately. And it certainly did today. Revelation 19 and verse 17. John says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Now who's sitting on the horse? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and who's his army? That's us. And they've all gathered up together here, basically the whole world. Remember, he, Jabin, he was collecting everybody he could. Hills, valleys, mountains, it didn't matter. And they all had come and camped together. Well, who's the beast there in verse 19? That's the Antichrist. So he's done the same thing. He's like Jabin. He's running this show, and he's got all the kings of the earth and all their armies, and they've all come together. And they've come together for one purpose, to make war against him. Uh, it says over there in Joshua, they had uh, come to fight against Israel. So they've all joined up for this similar purpose. But in verse 20, it says, And the beast was taken. And with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Now, I, I like the way that they're just taken. Uh, I wonder who's going to take them. You ever thought about that? Angels, or would it be one of us? I would volunteer. I would, I would happily take on that duty. I'd <laughs> but him and the false prophets, somebody's just going to grab them. Somebody on our side, and they're going to be cast alive into the lake of fire. They're not going to be killed first. Uh, they will be alive when they hit the lake of fire. Uh, but they won't be for very long. And then in verse 21 it says, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So we're his army, but we're not going to have to do any fighting. All he's going to do is just speak the sword of his mouth. He's going to say the word, and every one of them are going to fall down dead. This is the battle of Armageddon. So that's what I was reminded of here in Joshua chapter 11. Turn back there. They're very similar to me because what you've got in both instances is this last ditch desperate effort to stop God's people, uh, to stop Joshua to stop Jesus. 
This is the final battle that they've assembled everything they've got uh, to fight against him to determine the final outcome. This is like the final battle here uh, for, the, for the promised land. In verse 6 it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hawk their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Now, not sure how, if Joshua had already learned of what was going on in the north, that this uh, group had been assembled against him, or if this is the Lord telling him here. But God speaks to him, and he very clearly tells Joshua the first thing he says, be not afraid because of them. And I believe the Lord would say the same to you and I tonight. He'd say, be not afraid because of them. Seems like there's a multitude against us, right? And they've got a lot more technology or weapons on their side than we do. But if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. I don't have to be afraid of them because I know him and he's on our side and we're on his side. God says for tomorrow about this time, so about 24 hours, Joshua, will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. God said, I will. I will do this. I will take care of you. I will meet your needs. I will see you through. Uh, we can believe him and we can trust him and we can put our confidence in him tonight. He says, thou shalt hawk their horses. Bonus points for anybody who knows what it means to hawk a horse. Yep. What he Tie his hamstring. Uh, hawk is... Uh, old English word. Uh, some call it just a King James Bible word for hamstring. Now, I've never hamstrung a horse. Have you? Got any horse hamstringers here? From what I understand, it's a way to cripple the horse. You know, I think you actually may cut their hamstring. And that's what God's telling them to do. Hawk their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Why would God tell them to do this? Here's this new technology that they've not seen before, that they've not faced, and so after God delivers them to us, why don't we just take that and use it for ourselves? Then we could have horses, and we could have chariots. Well, I believe what God's doing here, and what he's uh, saying to Joshua He's saying, you are to rely on me. And you are to continue to rely on me. Not physical might and not progress. Sometimes I think we get hung up on the need for progress. And sometimes progress is good. Don't get me wrong. There have been some good things, advances that have been made but progress is not always good because sometimes progress takes you away from what was good and what was right. And I've seen it in churches for years, uh, this idea, philosophy, I don't know what it is, mindset, we need progress. If we're going to stay relevant, if we're going to keep a big crowd coming to our church, we need progress. I've even heard, I've been in churches where I've heard those words basically say it. And it's got to be for the sake of progress. Well, that's all fine and good. But see, the Bible also says to ask for the old paths and to walk therein where is the good way. So we can, we can have progress. We've got us a nice projector here and 
things like that that we can use. But we best never wander away from the old paths. We need to stick with the old ways. Uh, I know it's not for everybody. But that's all right. Uh, I believe it's what the Lord wants for us. I, mean, I know it's what he wants for me. Now, if y'all say, preacher, we've decided we want some progress tonight and you just need to go, uh, we'd have to talk about that. But see, I, I just believe in the old-fashioned, old-timey ways of worshiping the Lord and serving him. So I think he was telling that to, to Joshua here. He's saying, you just keep depending on me. You keep doing things my way and you'll be just fine. All right, verse 7. It says, So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Merom suddenly, and they fell upon them. And we're going to see uh, some things in the way Joshua and the people fight this battle uh, that are, I think, important and that we should practice as we fight our battles for the Lord. And the first thing that I see here in verse number 7 is a boldness. It says uh, that Joshua came and all the people with him. So there's unity here. That's important too. We need to be in one mind and one accord if we're ever going to be effective for God. Mm -hmm. If we're going to have any spiritual strength at all, we've got to have unity. And so they come and uh, they attack them suddenly. I've told you before, it's so wonderful in the book of Joshua to see God's people on the offense. Here they are taking the fight to the enemy because they're not afraid. They have this boldness. They fell upon them. Isn't that good to see? Isn't that refreshing? That God's people fell on them. I think too many times we sit back and just wait for the enemy to attack us, uh, to, uh, to come at us. When, as we pointed out a couple of weeks ago, Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. And I believe that was his way of saying, I want you to, to march on the gates of hell, to, to repel the, the forces of hell back inside their own gates. We need that kind of boldness uh, to be about God's business and to be willing to do what he wants us to do suddenly. I think sometimes we're the opposite of suddenly. We're wanting to put things off and procrastinate. Uh, when God tells us to move, we need to move and, and be ready to, to strike when he says so. Verse number 8 says, And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them, and chased them unto great Zidon, and unto Mizrephoth Maim, and into the valley of Mizpah eastward. And they smote them until they left them none remaining. Second thing I see here in the way they fight this battle. There's the boldness that they started with, but there is also the dedication and the determination uh, that we see here in this verse. The Lord delivers them. God does his part. God said, will I? Yes, he will. And yes, he did. And now they're chasing them. And they continue to chase them. They don't just say, well, they're running away. They're on the retreat. Let's let them go. No, they go after them. And they, they continue after them until they left none remaining. In other words, they finished the job. Wouldn't it be good for you and me to have the same dedication, to have the same determination that we're going to see this thing through, that we're not going to let up until the job is finished? We want to do what God would have us to do and see it done. All right, and then verse 9 says, And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hocked their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. So there was the boldness in verse number 7, the dedication and determination of verse number 8, and in verse number 9 we see obedience. Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. 
I don't think I could ever emphasize the importance of obedience in our lives enough. Uh, how much God wants us to obey Him and to, to do as He bids us to do. Uh, he, he carries through on, on the exact instructions that were given to Him, hawk, hawking the horses burning the chariots with fire. So it would have been tempting, like I said, to have these new things, uh, to add to our arsenal, so to speak. But God had said no, and so Joshua doesn't do that. He is obedient. And folks, we need to seek uh, the same kind of obedience in our lives also. Well, I guess that's a good, that'll be a good stopping point for us tonight. Questions or comments? He delivered them up all slain. Did he slain some of those people before they started that battle? So it says in verse 8, The Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel who smote them. So... I was just wondering on that verse 7 there where he said that he would deliver him up all slain. You would think that, but verse 8 says that the Israel actually smote them. So God had delivered them. He's, he's already ensured the victory. But God's people still do their part. Just like we have to also. See the, see the value of Wednesday night Bible study? Now you know what a hawk and a horse man. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know what you're going to learn. <laughs> all hearts and minds clear. Amen. Amen. All right, let's all stand.